Hello, I'm Patty Asai, and I will be your moderator today for this incredible panel. As part of the Gap, as part of the Gap Web panels, Fiverr is giving away Fiverr credits and a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. At the end of the call, I will announce three winners of Fiverr credits to use for their own business needs. Also, one lucky audience member has the opportunity to win a one-hour one-on-one virtual business coaching session with the one and only Barbara Corcoran. I mean, yeah, insane, right? I, I, that's just amazing. For those who have registered for today's panel, you should have received an email upon registration that allows you to sign up for the panel Slack channel. Within the channel, you will be able to chat with other viewers and post questions for our panelists. Those within the Slack channel will have the chance to have a to win a one-on-one -on -one virtual business coaching session with Barbara for their participation. The winners will be selected at random. Now let's get started. Okay. So today's panel is called the future of female entrepreneurship. Why should we even care about female entrepreneurs? Why are female entrepreneurs important? Here's the reason, because when women own businesses, we typically outform, outperform men. Yeah, I mean, I know that comes as a shock to some people, but that is factually true. A Biz to Credit study found that women-owned businesses had higher earning growth, which is 27% over their male, male counterparts, which only grew 22%. Also, year over year, women-owned businesses showed an increase in overall annual revenue of 2% more and a decrease of operating expenses of 3% less than their male counterparts. So why are women so good in business? My theory is we don't think we know everything. We're willing and open to ask questions, to try to figure it out. But we have three amazing female entrepreneurs who are going to share their expertise with us today. On our panel, we have my favorite shark who always tells the men how to do it right. She is a badass businesswoman. And also I'm gonna call her an influencer, the one and only Barbara Corcoran. We also have the Fiverr CMO, Gali Arnon, and Our Place co-founder and co-CEO, Shiza Shahid. Ladies, welcome. Please introduce yourselves. Barbara, let's start with you. Thank you very much. Very nice to be here. Glad to have you. Hi, oh, Patty. Oh, sorry, Barbara. Go ahead. You want me to say more than that. Just speak up if you do. Yes, just tell us a little bit about yourself with people that have been living under a rock and oh, don't know a lot about you. <laughs> all right. Well, I made my good fortune in the real estate brokerage business, and I started when I was 23. I sold it probably 22 years later for $66 million, so I did very well. Since that time, I had to reinvent myself a few times <laughs> to make a livelihood, and my most recent reinvention of myself has been over the last 12 years on the great show Shark Tank which I get to be fairy godmother and decide who's going to be rich. Bing, bing, you're going to be rich. You're going to be a star. And so I have the absolute best job in the world. I had the, the great joy of building a business and everything that's involved in that. And also the great joy now of getting more accolades than I deserve. Amazing. Thank you so much, Barbara. Golly, okay. go ahead, please. So hi, everyone, uh, and thank you for having me today. My name is Gali Arnon. I am based in Israel, in Tel Aviv. I'm a proud mother of three daughters, uh, potential future leaders that I'm very proud of. Uh, I've been the CMO of Fiverr, um, a marketplace for entrepreneurs and freelancers, uh, and I've been the CMO of this company over the last six years. Um, started my first managerial role at the age of 24, and ever since then I've been uh, in different senior management role, uh, leading companies and marketing operations. Um, and I would love to hear from the, my colleagues here on this panel. Um, I'm sure there are things I'm, I don't know. Just like you said, Patty, we, we don't know everything, and I think this is the power of women, to ask questions yeah. and always hear from Absolutely. anyone around you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Shiza. It's such an honor to be on this panel with Barbara and Gali and, and Patty. I um, I grew up in Pakistan. My first uh, love and passion was uh, human rights, women's rights. I grew up um, as a volunteer, as an activist. I was fortunate to get a scholarship when I was 18 years old to come to the United States to study at Stanford University. 
that was when I was exposed to entrepreneurship and I realized you didn't just have to work through the nonprofit sector to have an impact. In fact, you could build a business and if it was guided by the right values, you could have an even larger impact. Okay. Um, I ended up going to McKinsey after college, but I quit that job um, when my friend Malala Yousafzai was shot by the Taliban for wanting to go to school. I was wow. 22 years old. Um, and with her and her father, I co-founded the Malala Fund, which is now uh, a global nonprofit helping the most vulnerable girls around the world access an education. Built that over the next few years, and from there started Our Place, which is a mission-driven business that is all about the power of food to bring people together. We design kitchenware products that make it easier and more joyful to cook at home. Uh, but the brand and the mission and the purpose is all about the why of cooking at home, to reconnect to our traditions, our communities, our families, our identities. Um, and Our Place has grown extremely fast um, and um, is in homes around the U.S., around the world. Um, and we're just getting started. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for introducing yourselves. Now we're going to get into it. I, I, I can't wait to hear the answers to all these questions. So let's start. All right. The first question that I want to ask is, what do you think are the key traits or characteristics of successful entrepreneurs or executives and how can others cultivate these traits? Golly, we'll start with you and then we'll end with Barbara. Yeah, I think it's a great question because I, I think it starts with the traits that a leader needs, right? So it's not necessarily a woman or a man. You need to be a leader. You need to be ambitious to set very high goals for yourself, to try to achieve them, to not be afraid to fail. I think those are common to leadership in general. You need to inspire people. You need to be able to work with people and, and, and create relationships. But then, you know, I think when you ask specifically about women, I tried to go back to, you know, what make me, what, what was, was there for me as a way um, in, in tough times, okay, you know, in order to create this, this leadership. I think it's first and foremost is to be yourself. I think that sometimes women, early on in their career, they're sometimes trying to be someone else. They look at other men as role models and they try right. to sometimes imitate them or to adjust to behaviors that are just not for, for them. And I think what, first and foremost, in order to be this leader, you need to be yourself. You need to believe in yourself. I know it sounds like a cliche, but... If you come into a room when you speak in front of a lot of people and you are not occupied or think or busy thinking about how people perceive you or, or how they judge you or they think about you and you're concentrating in being yourself, bringing yourself as it is with your weaknesses, with your powers, with your superpowers, I think that's the secret for leadership and specifically for women. I think we are amazing as we are and as long as we remember that every time we come to and we face challenges i think that that's the secret sauce mm -hmm. for me absolutely thank you so much golly shiza what what are your thoughts yeah i, I agree entirely and, and there's so many ways into this question but i wanted to throw in the word ambition just because i think you know, I, I thought of that word and then I felt a little embarrassed to say it because I feel like nowadays, you know, we're all writing rightly so about how, you know, work isn't everything and work-life balance. And, you know, I came from a place where my mother was never given permission to pursue higher education, to build a career, to choose her own husband. And I had to, she gave me an education and gave me permission to be free and to go out there and dream the biggest dreams I could possibly dream. And so I have always felt this deep sense of responsibility of being given these privileges to do something with them, to make something of them and to help others. And so I think I have been driven by a deep sense of ambition. And sometimes when I read, you know, uh, literature on how um, perhaps we shouldn't be as ambitious. Um, I worry that um, we're sending the wrong message because I would not, 
I come from very humble and modest roots and I would not be here today um, if I hadn't fought for it. But I do want to mirror that with one more word, which is compassion and empathy, because uh, your ambition drives you forward, but it is your compassion and empathy that enables you to build a team and inspire and motivate a team and you're not getting very far on your own. Um, and so I'd really like to pair those two words together. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And Barbara? You know, women don't often use the word ambition and I don't really understand why that is. A man's never embarrassed by that word nor a value that he aspires to. Yep. Um, I've never met an entrepreneur in my life or anyone who's accomplished anything who didn't have ambition. So I think it's as essential as breathing if you want to do well in anything, whatever your cause is. I found when I started my business, what became very essential for me is to see everybody around me, a man in a suit, an old boys network in real estate. They weren't going to let the girls in. Right. Uh, but to actually forget the fact that I was a woman, I never thought of myself as a woman. At first, the first meeting, I felt intimidated with the, all the men. Then after that, I decided I wasn't going to pay attention to it. I, instead, I thought of myself as their competitor. Much mm. better headset. Because thinking as women could get you in the way. It kind of makes you focus on the negative of what might be working against you versus the inner power of what you could bring to the table. Um, I think for all of us as women, whether you work for a corporation or whether you work for yourself, I think you have to get in the habit of over-contributing everyone else, out-contributing them, just yes. doing more for them, do more in every instance than the next guy does, and that gets you ahead. But I think what both executives and entrepreneurs have in common running the ship or leading a team is they have to, first and foremost, be really good at overcoming obstacles and solving problems, because that's what business is all about. And then the second important thing is they have to be really good about choosing the right people. The wrong people will get you nowhere. The right people can take you anywhere. And I think, I often think, could I have made it as a top executive? No, I absolutely know I couldn't have. I would have been in the middle somewhere disgruntled along the way because I lack the essential ingredient that every top executive needs because they're working with the large organizations, which is they have to be great politicians, and I'm not. But right. I think what every entrepreneur has that a lot of executives don't have is they have to be really comfortable with risk. You throw so much against a wall all the time, you know, and putting yourself out there. And a lot of executives are uncomfortable in that instance. So I think there's a place for everybody, but the basic skills are very much alike. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. And that takes us to the next question, which I, I speak about a lot, is how can women overcome the confidence gap and imposter syndrome in their professional lives. And I see this all the time. I always say that, you know, men walk into the office like they're walking into a, um, a weigh-in at a, like a boxing weigh-in. Their <laughs> chest is out, their head is up, you know, and they're walking like this versus women tend to be like shrinking violets. You know, our shoulders are down. And I always say that you have to take up space in the room because how you feel about yourself is the way that other people treat you. Mm. So how can women over overcome this confidence gap that we have in this imposter syndrome that we don't belong here. And we know that we do, right? But how can they overcome it? Barbara, let's start with you on that one. Well, I think as a woman, you have to realize everyone's got self-doubt. I mean, the men might have a better act, but let me tell you, the more successful someone is, the more self-doubt they have, because that's what drives them. I've never met a secure person who was a stellar star. Uh, right. My best salespeople at the Corcoran Group all had something wrong with them, honest to God. They were insecure the most. And that's why they worked so hard and outperformed everyone. Yep. The entrepreneurs that I invested on Shark Tank every day, I look for insecurity. I look yep. for a man, a woman who's mostly insecure because I know I got myself a winner. They're gonna, they have the ambition, they're gonna work twice as hard. Yes. I think uh, the great upside to feeling like you're an imposter, which is everyone feels, even I'm faking it now. I'm pretty good at it, right? Okay. <laughs> But I think, even, and might I also say, even when I sold my business after 20 some odd years doing everything I possibly could do right, I still thought maybe it was a fluke, a lucky break. Maybe I just got lucky in the right place at the right time. What a crazy thing to think of. Yeah. But I think your confidence grows as you experience your business in your life. And I think gaining confidence doesn't come from having a lot of successes because there are many more failures than there are in, with successes when you're growing your business. Mm. But I think gaining confidence comes entirely from knowing 
deep inside, unshakably, that you can out-try anyone. If you out-try anyone, you have the confidence in your ability to be there all the time. And that's what brings you success and gives you some semblance of confidence until you're worried about it again and thinking you, you have that imposter syndrome. I hate the name imposter syndrome because everybody's got it. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Th th thank you for that. And, and, I, and I, I really agree with you in, in that we all are insecure in some way, shape or form, even the top performers. And I, I happen to be a top performer. I'm not bragging, but I am very insecure too. Right. So that's why I work my butt off. And uh, that, that is just no secret. So thank you for that. Shiza, let's go with you. Yeah, I think I couldn't agree more with, with Barbara. Everyone experiences it. Maya Angelou is quoted as having said after publishing her 11th book that every time she wrote another book, she would think, uh oh, they're going to find out now. I've run a game on everybody. <laughs> and, and so, you know, knowing failure does not mean you're a fraud. Everyone fails. Um, and noticing that self talk, becoming aware of it, replacing it with something more positive. Even just saying your name out loud, uh, you know, when Malala was in, interviewed by Jon Stewart, he asked her when she was speaking out against the Taliban, her life was at risk. How would she overcome that fear? And she said, I would say, Malala, if he comes, just pick up your shoe and hit him. <laughs> and, and so if, you know, if it works for a Nobel Prize winner, it's good enough for us. But also, Patty, you said take up space. And so you'll notice... I wear a lot of puffy shoulders, just make myself <laughs> yes. a little bit bigger. So, uh, you know, also a, a good padded jacket, some good fashion, some good shopping is, is a good place to get started. <laughs> Thank you. Golly. Yeah. I, first of all, I couldn't agree more. And I feel like, you know, I feel like at home because uh, I think it's common to all of us. I want to tell a little story. You know, when I was like 17, I, uh, I studied uh, physics at school, at high school. And like physics, which is a, a very mathematical uh, subject to learn at school, I was there in a class with 30 kids, four girls and 26 boys, right? And I think, you know, there was a lot of times that I didn't understand what the teacher was talking about. And I was sitting there on the first row and asking questions because I didn't understand and I thought to myself, you know, I might be stupid if I ask all those questions because I don't understand. And then someone told me, but you know, you're doing a service for us all because we all don't understand really what's going on in the class, but you have the, right. the courage to ask. And I think this is something that happened to me through my entire career. So, you know, 20 years later, I'm sitting with um, a meeting in a meeting here at Fiverr, which is a very technological company with an R&D team of, and, you know, research and development team, all developers, they all know code, no women in, in the meeting room, I'm the only one, and they speak Chinese to me. I don't understand. So I ask questions. What does it yeah. mean and how will the customer understand it? What, what will be the customer experience? All those questions helps me figure out. And I think, you know, as Barbara said, with experience, I now know that I'm always doing service for others by the fact that I'm actually asking questions. I'm not the only one who doesn't understand what's going on. And by asking those questions that are sometimes very clever, I can find out more and I can be an expert in whatever domain there is, even if it's 95% women. And I also agree with Barbara in the sense that I don't think of myself as a woman, when I go into a room full of men, I think of myself as completely equal. And that helps me in whatever I do. I think about taking the air in the room. I, you know, always watch women when they go into a meeting room and they will usually not take the four seats or not, would never sit at, you know, at, at, the, at the head of the table. Right. Wow. And I always did it. And I also, you know, mentor others and, and provide training to others, other women to do that because you can't protect, you know, you can't expect people to give you the stage. You need to take right. the stage. Okay. So when I hear this sentence, women need to get a seat in the table. No, 
women shouldn't get a seat from anyone. Women should take the seat at the table because mm-hmm. no one else will give it to them, uh, just like men do. Absolutely. And, and to, just to kind of end, end this question is that when you're taking a seat at the table, you also have to be confident that you have value to add, right? As a woman, we typically have maybe different perspectives and our thought process are, are different. And we need to speak up because if we don't speak up, we, we, can't, we, we can't prove that we have value. And unfortunately, we, we have to do that. So thank you for that, Golly. I, I appreciate your insight and thank you all the panelists. Uh, now let's go to how do you measure success in your career, especially as an entrepreneur? It's so hard, especially when you're be- in the beginning and you're just in the depths of it, right? Mm-hmm. Nothing's going right. Everything's going wrong. How do you know you become successful? What are the metrics that you use to evaluate your progress? Mm-hmm. And let's go with Shiza. How about that? <laughs> I would say if I had to pick one, the question I ask most often is, am I learning new things? And how often am I learning new things? Is, does my brain feel like it's on fire in a good way? And and if that's happening, then I'm probably happy. Um, and it's something I ask my team all the time. Are you having fun? Um, because we can do hard things and we're going to have to do hard things. And we have, you know, as a business, we've experienced tremendous tailwinds. We've experienced tremendous headwinds. We've lived in this incredibly turbulent economic situation, you know, pandemic, uh, recession. Um, And so I I always tell my team, we're going to have to do hard things, but we have to find a lot of joy as we do those hard things, because otherwise it's not worth it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I would say, you know, constant curiosity, constant learning, um, feeling the sense of every day I wake up and that doesn't mean every single task I do is, is inspiring or fun. Um, but I understand the purpose behind it. I understand why Mm -hmm. getting these boxes shipped out matters so much. Mm -hmm. Um, and that there's a connection to the people that you're doing it with. Great. That's amazing. Barbara, how about you? How do you measure success? What are the metrics that, that you utilize? For me, the clearer the goal, the easier it is to measure and the easier it is to hit your finish line. Right. right. So I believe in having a really clear image of where you're ultimately want to go. For me, the first day I opened my firm, I saw myself as a queen of New York real estate, as clear as I could touch. I love it. it. I love it. And it provided for me uh, not a business plan because I had no idea what it, even what a business plan was, but it ma- it was for me my roadmap. And I did everything in my power to match that image of who I saw myself in the future. In terms of uh, measuring your goal, I think it's really smart to have intermittent goals on your way to the final goal because it's very hard to work at something for two years and say, how, how close am I going to get to where I want to go? No, I used to do things like uh, constantly um, measure how many new customers I wanted, how many new salespeople I wanted, uh, what market share I wanted on the west side of Manhattan when I was only on the east side. And I realized I needed to then open two new offices to reach that goal. So I think backing it down to actual action steps along the way keeps you honest and gets you to the finish line. I just think you need to measure intermittently to get to the ultimate finish line, but the most important is having that image of where you want to go. Absolutely. Completely agree. Golly, what are your thoughts around that? Right. So, you know, I it, it actually changed along the years. So I think, you know, if you would ask me this question 10 years ago, I would tell you that I measure my success by my title, my salary, my position, how impactful I am. I think it changed over the years. The way I measure success now is first and foremost, and I co- couldn't agree more with Chisa here, uh, is ha- if I'm having fun or not. I think just enjoying myself, developing myself, keep challenging myself is more important today than anything else. I would add to that if I enjoy working with the people I work with, because um, I feel like Working in a team, working with people you love, you can learn from, you admire, is really important. I think also the way I measure my success is if I do something that helps, you know, 
that is contributing to the bigger picture. I want to work for companies or for businesses that are adding something to the world, that are generating or contributing uh, to the world and doing something positive. Uh, and Fiverr is providing income to thousands of thousands of freelancers around the world. So I do feel like we are doing something and adding something positive to the world. So I think first and most foremost, fun, challenge, fulfillment, those would be my main criteria for success. That's really sage advice, especially for people starting out, because, you know, um, if you're competitive at all, like, like Barbara was saying, we tend to measure success by, am I number one? That's my, that's my first question. Am I number one? But there's so much past that and beyond that, that makes you feel successful on the inside. So ladies, thank you. Thank you for the insight. The mm -hmm. next question I, I want to ask is around my favorite my second favorite F word, which is failure. Um, how do you handle failures and setbacks in business? Because we know it's going to happen. And I always say that success is built on the back of failure. And without failure, you're going nowhere. So Barbara, why don't we start with you and golly, we'll end with you. Yeah, a pretty uh, simple formula, honestly. I give myself two minutes to feel sorry for myself. And then I get up and move on. <laughs> Love it. Said, it roll. Yourself. Yeah. I have met people that have upturns in their life or in their business and take six months to recover. You don't really know it, but they're quietly licking their wounds yes. and they'll hold you back. So two minutes, my limit, boom, up and running again. I've also learned over all the years that every time I had my biggest belly flops, the things that embarrassed me socially among my team, mm -hmm. things I just spent too much money on to try and it was a failure. Every time I had a big one, if I hung around, the flip side gave me a new idea and they become my biggest successes. So now I've actually convinced myself, if I have a really bad failure, there's something good coming. <laughs> the self fooling thing, but yep. it's not really because it has always happened that I pull myself ahead on the heels of failure. It's almost like you're bouncing a ball. The harder you hit it, the bigger the bounce you're gonna get coming up. And sure. so I learned to expect it because I've lived it so many times and I've seen it also through all the entrepreneurs I work with. It always happens. So I have a blind faith. Oh, great. And, and that makes you not give up, right? That's the most important uh, thing. Never. Because, never. Yeah. If, if, if you fail, that's okay. You just kind of brush yourself off and keep going. That's, mm -hmm. that's the focus. All right, Susan, let's go with you. Yeah, I think resilience cannot be overstated in terms of its importance to success. And so really cultivating resilience. I try and remind myself every time I don't ask, it is also a no, right? So right. We, we tend to over um, measure the things that we went for and didn't get versus all those opportunities we never tried out for because we were so okay. afraid. Those things are also no's. I think also in times of failure, especially if you're in leadership positions, understanding how to talk about that failure with your team so they trust you and you can learn from it together. If you're always, everything's great, everything's amazing, that will start to erode trust. So really using oh. those opportunities to build trust with your team and learn together. And finally, find joy in those times because it's really easy to have fun when you're winning, but businesses are made in tough times and bringing your team together to find joy and connection in hard times, that's the thing that will transform mm -hmm. your business the most. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Golly. Yeah, I think failures are, are a gift, to be honest, are a present mm -hmm. that life gives us because I think it's you can learn to be more um, human. We, we are all humans, we make mistakes. And as long as we're gonna embrace them, learn from them and move on. Um, as Barbara said, it's okay to be mes miserable for two minutes or two days or one yeah. week. Then you need to stop being miserable and feel sorry for yourself and move on. So I think, I think in Fiverr, we have a tradition of learning from our failures and from our mistakes. Uh, and it's something that we keep, um, we keep on insisting on because we feel like that's, that's a way to be better. And if you are making mistakes, if you are failing, 
you'll probably be better next time because you will know what to avoid, what you know, how to how to how to improve yourself. So I think we all humans, I think it's 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 fine to make mistakes. It's you need to embrace those failures. Uh, it will only make you a better manager, a better leader. Um, and I think the idea of talking about it uh, publicly, okay, sitting in a panel and talking about your failures and the mistakes you did and the, the wrong turns that you took, I think this is also setting examples for others that it's fine. And it's something that we always, all of us do all the time. Um, so I think it's not only important to make mistakes, it's also important to talk about them and as publicly as possible. Absolutely. I think social it, network, yeah, and, and just one more thing that ahead, I want to say, social, I think social network is a very, very strong, um, you know, tendency to show how we are all successful. Look at LinkedIn. No one is failing on LinkedIn. We are all <laughs> the, CEO, the CEO of the world, of the universe, and we are all super successful uh, on LinkedIn. You never hear about failures, not on LinkedIn. You never see ugly pictures on Instagram. I think we have, we, we actually have this duty to tell the world as leaders that we are not perfect. Well, absolutely. And, and I think one thing to know that's important for people to understand that most don't is all the top companies like Amazon, Google, Meta, you look at these companies and they require that they fail at least 10% of the time during the year. If they haven't failed at least 10% in something that they've done, if they haven't taken enough risk and they haven't learned anything. So that, that's something that all those top companies have. So we need to understand that failure, as you were saying, Ali, is a gift and embrace it. So before we go to the next question, I just want to remind people, if you join this webinar session Slack channel, please feel free to drop in questions for the panelists. Also, those participating, three people will have a chance to win a five or credits. And one winner will be a very, very, very lucky person, have an exciting opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one, one virtual business coaching session with Barbara. I wish I could be one of those people. Uh, the winners will be selected at random and announced at the end of the session. So stay tuned. All right. Um, so I want to get to a question that I want to direct specifically to Barbara. And I want to direct this to you because I use Fiverr in a lot of the things that, that I do for my website, for just a lot of things that I just find the platform to be so amazing. So as an entrepreneur, Barbara, what are some of the biggest challenges you face in scaling your business and how can freelancers on Fiverr learn from those experiences to grow their own businesses? Yeah. Well, I think number one, you have to bear in mind that the only way to grow a business is through other people. I mean, I could have been the best superstar in New York selling apartments, but it wasn't until I had a thousand people working for me that I had a real business. Right. Right. So I think you have to grow your business on your own initially to get it started. Very often we all are in that position, but you have to think right away. What talent do I lack? If I want a big business, what am I good at? What am I not good at? For right. me, I have a very limited skill set. I'm really good at hiring the right people, which is an important one, no doubt. And I'm really good at marketing. And that's it. That's where it ended. That's yeah. not enough to grow a big business. But I constantly hired the talent that I didn't have. I wasn't afraid of that. What do I need? What can I do? What don't, don't I excel at and bring that person in? Right. That's what is amazing about Fiverr because they make it so easy. I have hired so many different trades from Fiverr on even small tasks that are essential for that point in time but a limited amount of time and gotten the best talent, choose the best talent, bring them in, get them to do what I want yeah. for me, what I, what my needs are and my business shoots ahead. I think, so the first thing definitely is you need people to grow your business and you have to reach out and get the people who do what you don't do well. The second is you have to realize you have to reinvest all the money you make into your business for a lot of years. If you're serious about your business, I think I was in business five years before I made more money than my lowest sales peer person. It was embarrassing. <laughs> but every dime I had, I put back into yeah. the business to focus on the growth. And never once did I ask myself, when will I have a profit? Never worried. Right. I just grew aggressively and the profit takes care of itself. If you're running a decent ship, it gets growing, 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 gets bigger because you're reinvesting all the time. So those, I think, um, are what every freelancer needs to know. 
to grow your business if you're serious about being hugely success successful in, in your work. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And I have one final question before we get into the audience questions. And I know a lot of people want to know this. Um, from your perspective, if you had to recommend one book or one podcast for female entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. what would it be? Golly, let's start with you and then we'll end with Barbara. I, I'm going to be super honest. And I'm going to tell you that what I do in my free time <laughs> is I don't, I listen to music. I listen to podcasts, but not about work. When I read books, I read novels because, you know, that's what makes me happy. So what I don't do, and I never did, is read instructions books or training or mentorship. What I do is I learn from people around me. And when I have free time, I just read novels because I, my, my biggest hobby is reading. And what I need in order to clear my mind and actually think straight about the challenges ahead is to go to a different universe and read novels. So this is my honest opinion. And, and again, Great. in light of, of this, uh, um, being a woman and being uh, exactly who you are, that, that's my uh, it's sincere answer. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. We, we appreciate sincerity. So thank you so much. Shiva, how about you? I love that. And I'm, I'm picking up on Gali's theme because my recommendations are not... Um, perhaps business books per se. They're more really honest stories by inspiring women about their lives, um, which fueled their success. Um, so I had uh, Bozma St. John's The Urgent Life. Uh, Bozma's fantastic. She's uh, She was most recently the CMO of Netflix. Um, and it's this incredibly honest and beautiful memoir of, of her life and journey. And then on the podcast front, I have We Can Do Hard Things with Glennon Doyle. Um, really inspiring and, and really honest and raw. Wonderful. And last but not least, Barbara. Well, there's one book I've read probably six times. Well, I'm not sure. And I don't read business books, honestly. But it's How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's been around probably yeah. since the dinosaurs were on Earth by Dale yeah. Carnegie. But it's all about people, which I believe is what business is, it has little to do with the numbers, all to do with the people. And then the podcast that I totally enjoy and learn something from every single one I listen to is how I built this with Guy Raz. I think it's amazing. Short stories told by the people who built the business, what they did right, what they did wrong, how they got started, how they failed. And I just listened to that half hour later, I'm a lot smarter. And it's all <laughs> entertaining. I think yes. you, too, you too, you were a loser. Great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wonderful. Yes, we, 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 all, we all need, um, I think we all need reinforcement that we're not the only ones that are losing sometimes. So thank you for that, Barbara. Really appreciate it. Now we're going to go into some viewer questions. And our first question is from Angela W., what one, what one moment propelled you forward with more fire than anything else you did toward your success? Mm -hmm. Love that question. Barbara, we'll start with you and we'll end with Gali. Mm -hmm. Oh, you said me. Yes. <laughs> I'm not a good student. Forgive me. I'm totally no, it's okay. What I'm hearing. All right. Uh, it was one instance in my life that made the biggest difference when my boyfriend and business partner ran away with my secretary, Tina. I thought I'd oh. die a thousand deaths. Right? Oh. I didn't think I'd recover. Right? However, on the way out the door, when I broke up the business divided in two a year later, he said to me, you know, you'll never succeed without me. Oh. And he gave me the gift of a lifetime. I swear I wouldn't be standing here without that insult because insults can be a motivator if you have the yeah. backbone for it. And I did everything in my power when I thought I had tried everything at the junctures along the way where the business was failing. I was over leveraged, mm -hmm. owed everybody. I would just think of that little smirk on his face <laughs> and think of one more thing. So that was the single best thing that ever happened to me to provide long-term motivation, the, the fuel that I needed to really keep going. I love that. It, it's it's kind of like, a, oh, yeah, let, let, let's see you. what's going to happen. Yes. Yeah, I'll show you. I love that. Yeah. All right, Shiza. Barbara's stories are giving me goosebumps. Um, yeah, I love it. Um, so I was 22 years old. I was a year out of college. I had taken my first job out of college at McKinsey. 
I'd moved to Dubai. Um, I had no savings. I come from a modest family. And at the time I was a Pakistani citizen, which meant my mobility in the world was very restricted. I basically had to be employed by a large corporation that was sponsoring my visas, or I would have no option other than living in Pakistan where, um, you know, growing up, I tried working, I experienced a lot of sexual harassment. Um, and so I took this job at McKinsey and I had a five-year plan. I would do the three-year program. I would go to business school and then maybe I would build my own thing. And a year in, I had just landed in Egypt when I got a text message telling me that my friend Malala Yousafzai had been shot by the Taliban for wanting to no. go to school. Um, I was devastated. I was with her and her family the next couple of weeks in the hospital. Thankfully, she recovered, came back stronger than ever. And I realized that what she had been through had the power to inspire real change for girls around the world. Mm -hmm. wow. And her and her family said, I, I went to her and her family and said, I think we should start this nonprofit. And they said, OK, we'll do it if you do it. Um, I was like, I'm, I'm 22 years old. I've never done this. Um, they're like, we trust you. We want you to do this. And I said, no, I, I can't do this. I have to make a living. I have no idea how to start a nonprofit. I went back to McKinsey, sat at my laptop, tried to work on the spreadsheet where we were optimizing costs for some client. And I just couldn't do it. I ended up quitting my job, moving to New York with a suitcase and a visit visa at the time and starting the Malala Fund. And I share that story because I think there's been multiple moments in my life where the opportunity or what the moment called for was the exact opposite of the plan. Mm -hmm. And somehow in my heart, I had this strong sense of this is what I'm meant to be doing right now. And every time I've taken that leap, um, it's been for the better. It's been scary and terrifying, but it's been for the better. And so I know that everyone on Fiverr is motivated and ambitious and has plans and goals, um, but just staying open to what comes your way and that the way you had mapped out your life may not be the way it, it plays out, but it may turn out even better. Absolutely. Thank you. And golly. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Those stories are absolutely amazing. Um, I'll tell a little story. Uh, when I was just starting my career, I, um, at the age of 27, I became a CEO of, of a company here in Israel. It was uh, an international school of English. It was a part of a, a global network of schools of English for adults. Uh, it was part of the Kaplan and the Washington Post at the time. Um, and I was a very young CEO. Um, it was extremely challenging for me at the first year because my management team were used to be my colleagues up until like <clears throat> you know a few days ago, and that now I'm the CEO. They didn't give me any, they gave me hard time at the beginning, challenging me, you know, with leadership tests all the time. And I had a rough year at the beginning and then everything started to fall into places. I replaced my management team. I, I created my own team of people who were loyal and uh, to me and, and worked together with me as a team. Um, I started opening f more and more centers around Israel <clears throat> but there was one that was very special for me. Uh, we opened a new center in Jerusalem as part of our extension, uh, expansion and being successful in, in the local market here in Israel. And my grandfather, he used to live in Jerusalem. Uh, he immigrated to Israel when it was, it, it was even before the, the, the country was founded. And uh, he came from Germany just before the Holocaust. And this is the way his life uh, was was actually saved. And I remember inviting him to this opening ceremony uh, where we opened the center in Jerusalem. Uh, and he came, you know, he was in his, I think, 80s already. Um, and he was standing there. You were like, you know, it was a big team of people. We were very excited. And just seeing him standing there, you know, after everything they've been through after immigrating to Israel and creating this country from nothing yeah. um, after the Holocaust, it was such, I felt so proud. Uh, I think it was like one of the proudest moments in my life uh, 
being able to bring him to my story, to my achievements, right. to my career. Yeah. So that's, that was a very, very um, emotional moment for me. God, amazing. Great stories from all of you. Thank you. And this is our final question. It's for Barbara. Mm -hmm. And uh, it says, any tips or advice for millennials entering the real estate market during a nationwide housing shortage, increasing rates, and a potential recession, et cetera? And, you know, I want to note that this is advice for millennials. And I have one is don't quiet quit. You got to work your butt off to get somewhere. So I just want to start there. And I'll let, let you take it from there, Barbara. You know, what's wonderful about an uncertain market is it has room for newcomers. Mm. What's also great about great. uncertain markets is the customer is looking for a new angle on stuff. Wow. They are unsure. They want stronger guidance. So if you're in any middleman capacity, like a real estate broker, you're in a power position. The old timers Indeed. tend to do things the same old way again and again. They see the market change, but they've been doing things a certain way so long it's hard for them to change with it. I think if you're starting out in the business and you really want to learn quickly and you really want to capture a large audience just for yourself, the smartest thing you could do is go to work for an older top salesperson for free if you have to. Yep. Be their coffee girl if you have to. Yep. But you will learn more sitting next to that entrepreneur. That's what salespeople are. You'll learn more in one week than you could learn in six months of a training program. So the Absolutely. quicker you could attach yourself to someone to learn everything and then go out on your own, you'll we'll leave that person with their exhaust business, the two smaller deals that they don't really want to do. They'll actually give you the business and you're up and running. But it's the single best time to start anything is when things are uncertain. I've learned that again and again. I'm so good when things are down, moving ahead. I could never move ahead in great times because everybody else wanted to as well. <laughs> right. You have to kind of distinguish yourself, right? That's an opportunity to set yourself apart from other people. Of course. And you have the best shot at standing apart because the world is accommodating you. The platform has changed. Absolutely. Wow. What great, great advice. Thank you to the panelists. This, this was just invaluable for me and I'm sure for everybody that is watching. So now it is time for us to announce the winners. So, oh, uh, this is so good. So good. The winners of the Fiverr credits are Tracy Clark. I'm just clapping for you because I know you're happy. We'll clap for each one. That's yeah, right. Yeah, thank you. Jamina Jacob. Yay. Yeah. And Angela Daniels. Angela. Yeah, Angela. All right. And our lucky winner who has won the once in a lifetime opportunity to wait, have. Wait, wait, a wait, just wait a minute. Just pick someone who's a male, tall, and handsome for you. <laughs> 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 you know what the guys like that typically aren't smart because they've gotten away with their looks so you want someone yeah, better so <laughs> we're, we're gonna pick someone better for you barbara so all right one-on-one -on -one virtual business coaching session with barbara patty Asa oh no sorry that's me um it is michelle delucci i hope i'm spelling it i'm pronouncing it correctly hey, michelle. Michelle, congratulations can't wait to get my hands on her amazing you are michelle you're so lucky I, I can't even tell you how lucky you are this is amazing and congratulations to all the winners fiber will contact you shortly to award you with the prizes thank you to the panelists and thank you for the audience for joining today's web panel the future is female entrepreneurship congratulations to our lucky giveaway winners all of the panels discussed today will be available to you to stream on fiber youtube channel starting tomorrow up next, we have our fourth web panel, The Fight for Financial Freedom, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern time. I highly suggest it. You don't want to miss it. You guys have an amazing day, and thank you to you and all our panelists. Honored to be with you, ladies. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Go out there and kill it, ladies.